Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. One plant that's recently grabbed everyone's attention is the butylon. Through drought and freeze, they stand out with maple-like foliage that drips with lanterns of color. Today, May Sanchez from Barton Springs Nursery shares her favorite specimens and explains how to grow them. On tour, let's take a ride on a garden railroad. The full myth is that Fredericksburg and Lana were always connected by rail. And a, log, a sawmill was put in, the logs would come in across the line, and then they back the logs into the sawmill and take the finished lumber away. Since Steve Blackson built a garden railroad, the backyard is more than a pleasant spot to hang out with his wife Betty, their grown children, and the grandkids. Now it's where history comes alive with G-Gage models on a trip through the hill country. After years of smaller scale railroading in the garage, he moved outdoors. For one thing, he wanted less breakable cars for his railroading grandkids. But mainly, Betty wanted a garage back after 35 years. She said, I don't care what you do as long as I don't have to see it. It was just the incentive to build formal raised beds around the pool to deal with an eroding slope. The goal became to hide everything and to integrate it into the garden, which was, I think, one of my best achievements. <laughs> That's what I was out to do. As a member of the Heart of Texas G-Gagers, Steve learned new design techniques. Everything is different outside compared to in the garage. In the garage, when you build your trains and your layouts, you usually work under the layout. The garden railroaders must work from the top. Steve covered his wiring with crushed limestone. On any scale, outdoors or in, true railroading is more than setting up a track. There's a difference between a toy train and a model railroad. And for years, Lionel was considered toy trains. They went around, signal lights flashed, milk cans came out of cars, and there's just action trains. But a model railroad is a model of a given railroad or of an era or of a period where you stay authentic. And it's what we call prototype. The prototype's the real one. We're making a model of the prototype. Using mathematical compression, his 325 feet of track travels the hill country with main lines and branch lines, dedicated for passenger cars or those hauling freight. I call mine the Cypress Canyon Railroad. It's uh, mythological, but it's geographically set up exactly the way the hill country is. It goes south to north from Fredericksburg to Lano, east to west through Lukenbach, Stonewall, Johnson City, Marble Falls on in the spice food and balconies. Along with geography, it's hands-on history. I do everything the way it originally was. We have to have an economic reason for the train. It was the railroads that built America, and that's our economic reason. Here, we're, we're into lumber. We're a log, turn of the century logging operation. Nothing will be later than 1934. And we're bringing wood into the sawmill, taking the finished lumber over to a barrel factory, taking the barrel factories over to a the barrel over to a brewery, filling it with beer by truck to Lukenbach and ship the rest out by rail as an OEM. There'll be furniture makers, coffin maker, other wood related jobs, but there'll be other industries too that support. We need gravel, we, this is Texas, we'll have oil. So uh, there's economic reasons, and that's the way we run the railroad. We have work to do. We're not here to play, we're gonna have work to do. <laughs> I saw my mile Some of his work means intricate building, like for the trestle he crafted. It's also a study in science and math, from setup to operation. And my grandkids love it because they grew up with Thomas the Tank Engine. They're used to 
uh, hauling cars and sh shunting cars and hauling freight, as they say on Thomas. And when they do get on the train to Chispa Circle, they go, Grandpa, this is boring. When the grandkids come over, they take turns at engineer and brake man, arranging routes and schedules to avoid collisions. So it's run just like a real railroad would run. Things don't always go perfect. Things get behind schedule quite often, and you have to reroute, hold, and wait, um, just like you would if you were driving a real train. But in a garden railroad, real plants also figure into the equation. In the garage, when you build something, you, the last thing you do is the scenery. In the garden, the first thing you do is the scenery. In the garage, the scenery never grows, never gets bugs, never has to be trimmed. In the garden, it is constantly changing. Things are blooming, dying, growing, and so you have to cut it away from the track. And I am often say, gee, this never happened to me in the garage, never. <laughs> Oak leaves and pollen need cleanup for power run through the tracks. Steve has a battery-powered locomotive, too, where track debris isn't a concern. Like every gardener, Steve is always experimenting with evergreen structure and seasonal changeouts. But in his case, he's going for a landscape in miniature. Small spruces, a favorite with garden railroaders, are out of their region, but he's up to the challenge. I just love the way they look. They add to the depth. I got them in different sizes on purpose. I have small ones, middle size, and big ones because nature's going to be all different size. Can't put them all in at the same size. It wouldn't look natural. Next will come more buildings and landmarks. Although he buys some and modifies them, complete with lighting, he builds many himself. As I put the buildings in, I'm planning to use dwarf Japanese maples to provide a contrast. They have a beautiful leaf to them and mixed among the maples are going to look gorgeous, uh, among the spruces are going to look gorgeous. And like a regular garden design, Steve is going for a 3D view where every perspective reveals something new. Recently, Steve's hobby put him on a new career track, designing garden railroads for others. This is off the deep end, but uh, this represents, like I say, 35 years of modeling and what I actually wanted to do. I consider it my Dennis Hopper retirement plan. You know, I'm not about ready to stop and get in the rocking chair. <laughs> I'm going out and play with my trains. Well, thanks for taking us on a spin around your garden on your Garden Railroad. Right now we're going to be talking about one of the hottest new plants for Central Texas. Not necessarily a new plant, but one that has certainly caught fire. It's the abutilons. And I'm joined by May Sanchez from Barton Springs Nursery, who is a, a Butylon fan. Yes, <laughs> I have my vote. <laughs> Great to have you back to Central thanks, Texas thanks for Gardener. Me. Now, these, this plant family are sometimes called blooming maples, flowering maple, right. Chinese lanterns, Chinese bell lanterns, flower, right. Indian mallow. Yeah, and, and I want to. I'm going to pull one <clears throat> out so we can start talking about show people what we're talking about right away, and then we'll kind of talk about how to take care sure. of these guys and show a variety of different ones. Now, this this is just a little baby, of course. Right. Uh, and this uh, a beautiful red bloom on it, and you can see that this has got to be related to the hibiscus family. Mm -hmm. It's in the mallow family, right? Uh, which of course the hibiscus are included in as well. I brought yeah. this small one just because it has a bloom on it. Right. Um, ultimately, that plant can get a couple feet tall, two to three feet tall. It's relatively compact for abutilons. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you can see kind of that one's actually pretty open for an abutilon. Generally, right. you'll see them more closed and bell shaped, but you can kind of see how it's hanging upside down like right. that. Right. Right. Hence the Chinese lantern. It yep, has that Chinese kind of lantern-like lantern right. look when they're hanging down side like mm -hmm. that. Kind of like our native Turks cap, the way that they hang down. Yeah, exactly, and closed and, up. And I love the papery quality of the right, bloom. Right, that's kind of lantern-like as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh -huh. So this is this is uh, what the bloom c looks like. There, there are a whole range of different colors. Mm -hmm. Now we have um, a more mature uh, version of the same uh, variety over here. Uh huh. And uh, this one is nice and full and kind of has... It's pretty a, compact for abutilons. Right. Um, you know, they range anywhere in size from 
a foot tall to eight to ten feet tall. So they can get really rangy. They can get tall fast, some varieties. Mm -hmm. um, this particular one, you saw them, you know, year, ten years ago or so we were talking mm -hmm. about they were grown primarily as indoor plants is how people knew yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember when I first saw them, I thought, how beautiful. Surely they will not grow in the ground here. I'll keep it in a container. And it lasted for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I can keep them in a, in a greenhouse or even in mm -hmm. bright light inside just mm -hmm. fine. Uh, and then I guess as we became to, started to get more and more mild, our winters did, yeah. and people just tried to ex started experimenting more. We realized we can put these in the ground, no problem. Mm -hmm. Most, some of them are hardier than others, obviously. And even this past winter they came through. Yeah, there's some varieties that, you know, took a, some burning on their leaves, but otherwise pretty much semi-evergreen in a 10 okay. to 15 degree winter is pretty okay. impressive. So you said they range from two to feet to, up to eight feet? To eight feet, yep. Uh, and everywhere in between, there's some that stay three to four mm -hmm. feet, some will get... Now just looking at these plants, I would say morning sun, afternoon shade, something like that? Morning sun, they prefer, and I guess having grown indoors, that might be a testament to mm -hmm. how little light they can take, but they're really, if you're gonna give them half a day, make it the morning sun, and mm -hmm. afternoon sun, they can grow, but they'll wilt, that they'll look thirsty. They might not necessarily be thirsty, but mm -hmm. it's just kind of like stressing out from too much sun. Okay, so shade is an important factor. Shade, dappled sun, which is also mm -hmm. kind of appealing because you can at least, it's one of the few plants that gives you decent color for the shade. Okay, okay, what are the soil <laughs> conditions? I would, again, when I think of mallows and hibiscus, I think good rich garden soil and moisture. Uh, yeah, they don't, they're, they're tolerant of drought. I mean, uh -huh. they'll forgive you if you forget to water them. Okay, you know, that's they, good. Uh, but soil-wise, neutral alkalinity mm -hmm. or neutral at pH. They don't need to be necessarily acidic or alkaline. Right. Um, definitely add compost. I wouldn't dig a hole in Clay West Austin, <laughs> yeah, and stick it in the ground. You need to amend the soil for them. They, right. they'll, the better the soil, the better they'll do. Uh-huh. Um, and water, you know, the, if it drains well, they can be watered regularly. Okay. Um, there's actually a native of Butylon and South Texas native that wants really well-drained sandy soil. I couldn't right. get my hands on one to show you, but yeah. it, it kind of has that velvety. I think I've seen pictures of it. You're very velvety looking. Hypolucum. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, um, because these plants can get kind of rangy, mm -hmm. a lot of people might prefer to keep them a little bit shaped up or pruned. What's the appropriate time to prune these? Oh, you could prune them. They, they kind of continuously bloom throughout the year. They have like this okay. cycle that just they just keep on going with anywhere from like two to four weeks where they're not blooming. Um, and you can prune them. There's not, they're kind of between rounds right now. Like, you know, mm -hmm. midsummer is a good time when they're not, you know, between rounds of bloom, you can mm -hmm. prune them. They have a real random stem growth, I think. You, yeah. know, you can't really, I don't know, I'm sure there's a, the, a correct term for the way their stems are, right. but you can't really just take head shears and shear them. You no, kind of prune you selectively. Do it artfully. Uh -huh. Okay, bit by bit. Okay, now yeah. let's show some other varieties. and. I, I don't know if you, we know the name of this one. It's a, a, a nice Call white it Alba form. Alba flora. Alpha flora. Alba. Alba flora, of course. And uh, this one is a little, probably a little more typical in terms of the bloom form. You right. Think? It's right. More closed, hanging upside down. They Glowing almost white. always will have different color. Yeah. Calyx as, as well. Yeah, really lovely a white color that would certainly look cool in a summer garden. Yeah, and in the shade too, it'll brighten it up. Oh, absolutely. And these can get covered in blooms. I mean, yeah. hundreds of blooms on a mature plant. That's awesome. That just kind of hang like ornaments uh, upside I down. I love the sound of that. I mean, a, a really great show. Yeah. Now there's some other name varieties we want to highlight. Mm -hmm. One is called Marilyn, and um, I, we don't have one here, I don't believe, but we have an image of it. Tell me about this variety. Marilyn's Choice, um, it's kind of sprawling. You do need to give them space if okay. you're, you know, other than the more compact forms, you'll, you'll want to give them three to four feet wide at okay. least. Um, and Marilyn's Choice is kind of an angular one. It has a beautiful, uh, like dark red calyx with a yellow with yellow petals, mm -hmm. um, which is a really nice contrast. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and also super hardy. That one was evergreen this winter for mm. us at the nursery. You know, 15 Fantastic. degrees or so. Yeah, 15 degrees in evergreen. Yeah. Wow, I'm, that's and, impressive. Yeah, we don't baby it at all. It's minimal cool. water. That's what we want to hear. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> Survival of the fittest. So Maryland is a, a beautiful yellow form. Uh, uh -huh. There's a pink form that's real common, and pink, I don't know. You don't I don't know, know. know what the name of this one is but we have a beautiful pink I flower think it's just a show. hybrid pink yeah, yeah. Um, it's got pink with like dark pink veins in it so another nice contrast um, and that's one of the taller ones it's mm -hmm. also really woody I mean that one gets almost small tree form 
They can get like up eight that. feet, ten feet. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'll say is I, I haven't noticed the butylons to be, you know, five to seven years is an expected life term. Okay. You know, they, they're not long-lived perennials. So it's but not that's like a shrub that enough. you're going to plant and have there in, for generations. Yeah, but that's well, that's, okay. yeah, so far that's my observation. Yeah. Is that after about five to six years, they'll just kind of die. Uh -huh. There's another no. striking form that we have an image of, and it's called that y'all I think at Barton Springs Nursery have a, a dubbed it pa Patrick's abutilon. Right, Patrick Kerwin, the designer, uh, brought mm. that to us from cuttings. It's a abutilon pictum, mm -hmm. and that is e definitely one of the most striking flowers you'll ever see, with the bright orange blooms, with these deep red veins running through it, and yeah. purple anther in there. It's really unbelievable, and the light, the, uh, you know, like we talked about earlier with the paper. Yeah. Petals, the light kind of shines through them. And yeah, there's them. kind of a glowing quality mm -hmm. to that that's really special, I think. And yeah. I noticed it just looking at the one that I held up a short while ago. Now, the leaf form is uh, striking as well. Mm -hmm. and we have a couple of specimens over here. We have we can get a closer look at the leaves. And this is where that name uh, blooming or flowering maple comes in because right. these are very maple like uh -huh, uh, looking leaves. Very attractive foliage, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think. They do vary a little bit, just mm -hmm. in, I mean, you could see some with the more heart shaped and some right. have more lobes than others. Right. Uh, Patrick's has a glossier leaf to it. It has uh -huh. a, it's, you know. Just like a lot of the hibiscus, you get some that are soft looking yeah. and others that are very shiny, shiny and slick. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that one had a very star like shape, very pronounced, and the next one has more of the palm shape. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, and you know, I guess you can make the argument that the broader leafed ones can tolerate more shade, maybe, mm -hmm. or the smaller leafed ones more sun. Yeah, never, that's tends to be a, a sign. It's a general that, rule, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you, there are a lot of cool varieties there. Now, there's a before we depart entirely, we've been talking about abutilons throughout here. But there's a related plant that you brought one in that's blooming right now, and we just have a, just enough time to show this off because for folks who like this plant family, this is added enticement. This is a mallow. Yeah, I mean, you can't resist the bloom. Yeah, these are mallows. The yellow is a hibiscus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called lemon rose mallow, yeah. and it's just now starting, and it'll go all summer in the shade. Yeah, well, the yellow mallow is stunning. And May, thank you so much for sure, coming yeah, on. Uh, hopefully, we've piqued people's curiosities about yep. these beautiful plants. I think you'll probably have a run on them at Barton Springs. All right, Springs we got them. <laughs> okay. Plenty. All right. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you. All right. And coming up next is Daphne Richards. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. We've been getting some great viewer questions recently, and here's another good one. We have a Chitalpa tree that's trunk has split. Let's we'll start with a little background about this plant because it's key to knowing what the problems are. This is a hybrid between Chilopsis, or desert willow, and Catalpa. This is a larger tree than the desert willow with light wider leaves and larger flowers, but it's much smaller than its other parent, Catalpa. As you know, Catalpa is a very large tree, and so you want to keep trees much smaller usually in your landscape. Catalpa also uses a lot more water than your desert willow. This tree was thought to have the best qualities of both of those plants, and it used to be recommended widely in the Southwest until we discovered problems with it tolerating extreme heat. So trunk splitting is a very common problem with this tree. Growth does return easily, but splitting happens continually every year. Trees can never completely recover from that, and not much can be done to prevent it. Also, complete defoliation in the summer is very common. So if this has happened to your Chitalpa tree, don't waste time. Go ahead and remove it and replace it if you want to, a similar tree, Desert Willow. The flowers on the Desert Willow are just as beautiful, but the leaves are more billowy. It's also much low water use and extremely heat and drought tolerant. It's a deciduous tree with really great winter sculpture. Our plant this week is Calilophus berlanderi, or berlanders or Drummond's sundrops. This is another one of our wonderful native plants, and the common name comes from the flowers that look like little drops of sunshine. It's covered in four inch wide, four petal yellow flowers, which as I said, look really nice. It flowers from early spring through summer, and it's another plant that's great for rock gardens or decomposed granite sites. It spreads to as wide as 20 inches, so give it lots of space. It normally forms little rounded clumps about 12 inches tall. It's hardy to zone seven, which makes it only hardy to about five degrees, which would normally make it great in our gardens. And as I said, it's native, so it does 
um, tolerate that in nature. It does prefer full sun and well-drained soil in low to moderate water. To do in your garden this week, if you have blackberries, you've harvested those fruit a few weeks ago, so you need to go ahead and prune those plants back. You want to prune back all of the canes that bore fruit. And then the canes that did not bear fruit, you want to only prune them lightly. The canes are born, fruit is born on canes only in the second year of their growth. So those new canes, you don't want to prune back harder. You won't have much fruit next year. We'd love to hear from you. So visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Tricia Shirey for Backyard Basics. Tomatoes are everyone's favorite garden vegetable, but sometimes we have some competition for the fruits in the garden. And uh, one of the problems that you may notice in your garden is blossom end rot on tomatoes. Now this can occur when soil moisture fluctuates dramatically. Calcium uptake is slow in plants when the fluctuation of water make it unavailable to the plants. So you can get this sunken brown spot on the blossom end of the fruit. It's best to go ahead and pull any affected fruit off and don't let the plant uh, try to mature those and save its energy for further fruit. Uh, it's not uh, a problem to put those fruit in the compost pile. Uh, blossom in rot, it can be a calcium deficiency problem, but calcium deficiency is actually pretty rare in our Austin soils. Gypsum can be added if calcium is low, and you can fertilize your plants with comfrey and eggshells to give a uh, minor application of calcium to the plants. And foliar sprays with seaweed may help also if the problem persists, but mulch is actually the best way to help moderate soil moisture. Don't put it close to the stems and uh, avoid having too much nitrogen or magnesium fertilizers because that can contribute to the blocking of calcium. Similar looking black spots on areas other than the bottom of the fruit are probably early blight and those affected fruits should be removed and destroyed. Now, cracking and cat facing are other issues that can be a result of inconsistent watering, watering and too much nitrogen. The skin expands like a stretch mark. Uh, here's a fruit that's almost ripe, and then when we have a heavy rain, the fruit just splits. You can eat the fruits and cut away the cracks on plants, but um, if you have a heavy rain and you've got fruit that are almost ready like these, just pick those and allow them to ripen indoors so that way they won't crack. Now sometimes you'll go out to the garden and you'll see stems that just appear to have all of the leaves stripped off. There's no leaf inside on a stem, typically toward the top of the, the plant. Look for black droppings and then a big green caterpillar called the tomato hornworm. Just handpick those caterpillars. Uh, if you see a caterpillar that has white cocoons on it, those are the um, larval stage of a braconid wasp, a beneficial wasp, so leave those in the garden because you'll have lots more beneficial wasps in the garden. Sometimes you'll see downward curling leaves or puckered leaves and those are usually the result of aphid damage. And aphids and many other insects can transmit diseases to your plants so it's important to get those under control. Aphids are easily controlled with a strong blast of water, not enough to damage the leaves but just a good spray of water, also soaps and seaweed sprays. Sometimes you'll see leaf miners creating tunnels in your leaves. They have little trails that just look, look like they're uh, tracings on the leaf. You can pick and destroy the effective leaves, put them in a, a plastic bag and put them in the garbage. If the damage is not severe, treat with neem oil if you see a lot of uh, damage and a lot of affected leaves. Flea beetles you'll, will give you tiny little holes throughout the plant. Not usually a problem, more of a cosmetic issue, but if you have a lot of them, you might want to consider adding beneficial nematodes to your garden to help keep those under control for future garden seasons. Now, spider mite damage is something that we start to see is that the temperatures get really warm and plants can be a little bit drought stress. Leaves will look spotty yellow or bronzed. You may see webbing with severe infestations. You can control it by water blasting the leaves, uh, gentle water sprays with foggy nozzle. Neem and seaweed also can help to keep spider mites under control. Uh, making sure your plants are well mulched, though, is a, is a great way to keep the spider mites at bay. 
Now another thing that we see a lot of are stink bugs and they cause uh, dimpling and sunken spots on the fruit and it can really affect the flavor. They also can affect uh, our pepper plants and eggplant too. The stink bugs are fairly easy to control by uh, sucking them up with a vacuum. You can get little hand vacuums like this and just suck the insects up. And uh, it's, it's pretty simple to do. I sucked up all of these bugs in just a very short time in my garden yesterday. Now, remember that insects' metabolism increases as the heat of the day increases. So if you get out in the garden early in the morning or later in the evening, you can easily hand pick or uh, suck up and vacuum up the insects. But if you wait till the middle of the day, you're not going to do that. So uh, if you'll uh, get out and get in the garden and observe your plants and watch for insects, you'll have tomatoes for you and not for the bugs. Check out klru.org slash ctg to watch online and visit our blog. Next week, meet the artist behind Flat Flower Cards. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.